Hello and welcome to Counterculture. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, the New Culture Forum has just produced a new book. Here it is, The Long March, How the Left Won the Culture War and What to Do About It. It's by Mark Sidwell. Uh, that title pretty much sums up the discussion that we're going to be having today, and in particular, the second part, which is what we can do about it. Now, I'm delighted that we have been joined by the author, Mark Sidwell, who is also deputy editor of Smith magazine, and a great friend of the channel who's been on before, uh, Melanie Phillips, one of our best known columnists and author of such books as All Must Win Prizes and Londonistan, and Rafe Hadelman Q historian and commentator from the New Culture Forum. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, Mark, I, I want to start really um, by asking you that the, what you talk about in the book, what you write about, is a very, what appears to be a very haphazard history as mm -hmm. opposed mm -hmm. to, if you like, some plot. Can you explain? That, that's right. So the Long March is a uh, a strategy, a revolutionary strategy, that was uh, formulated in the late 1960s by a German radical called Rudi Deutschke. Uh, it was based on some earlier work, in particular by Antonio Gramsci, uh, the Italian communist, uh, and it was taken up much more widely after that, and notably by Herbert Marcuse in America, yeah. who was sort of the godfather of the new left. But essentially what Deutschke said was instead of using violence, which another wing of, of people that he was associated with in Germany were, were trying, you could instead try a, a long and slow and quiet revolution where you took over the institutions of a culture and so gradually changed the whole cultural frame around such that socialism, communism, these sorts of ideas might actually be able to get the traction that otherwise they couldn't. Melanie, is that, is that sort of a picture you'd agree with? I mean, do you, do you agree with the concept of the Long March, actually? Well, I have myself written several books about all this um, over the last 30 years. So I certainly do agree with it. Um, the question is uh, why it happened. Um, and in my view, uh, it was um, entirely, as uh, Mark Sidwell suggests, um, uh, the people that he mentions were, the, uh, were some of the key, uh, the key people. But the interesting thing to me was that uh, Western society fell for it. And the question is why? And I believe there were a number of reasons um, in Britain and in Europe um, I believe that there was a profound cultural demoralization after the Second World War, uh, which left the elites, the cultural elites, the political and intellectual elites, vulnerable to a set of ideas which otherwise wouldn't have been given house room. And consequently, the way, the, the way was left open for these ideas to be seeded into the institutions, which, as Mark said, well, uh, has just explained uh, was the strategy that you can overturn a culture and a society, or you can overturn a society from within by getting into the institutions of the culture and basically turning their values uh, inside out and upside down. Uh, you subvert from within. And in Britain, I believe that was done to the letter, uh, yeah. and in America too. Do you, do you think the same, Rafe, that it, basically this was, although it was intentional, it was almost by, not default, but also the, the fact that the, as it were, the establishment of Britain was, as Melody says, so demoralised, it actually sort of, they didn't resist. I mean, that's just as important, isn't it? That's right. And in fact, if you speak to KGB operatives, it should be said, demoralising a society is one of the ways in which you actually do engage in, in revolution by un undermining and subverting the, the, the establishment. So whilst I agree entirely that there wasn't any great conspiracy, it must be noted, however, that it was 20 years after the 1968 protests and uprising and Marxists that we actually saw the biggest change coming into to being, particularly in Britain. It was 1997, after all, that the Blair administration came in. And one has to actually remember, how, or even point out, how many members of that Labour cabinet were actually former communists. Alistair Darling, John Reid, Alan Milburn, Peter Mandelson, Stephen Byers, these were card-carrying communists. Even Tony Blair admitted after the fact with, with, with Lord Peter Hennessy that he had been a Trotsky. 
Um, so you've got that entire class of people coming in, not just the politics. Andrew Marr, George Galloway pointed out, used to hand out communist pamphlets outside uh, King's Cross Station. So um, whilst there was no great conspiracy, you had, a, you had a, 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 a group becoming the new establishment who were basically Gramsciites or you know, trained very much in, the, in these arts. And, and I think, you know, the Blairite administration is important to point to. I talk about quite a lot in my books, and I think that would be surprising to people because we think about the Blairites as, you know, the opposite of, of the revolutionary Labour Party and, you know, going against uh, the unions and, and so on, and, and really as very, very sort of free market and one thing or another. But, but I think in many ways they played a crucial role in undermining um, the history and the traditions that, that provided that sort of stability. There was a real year zero quality to Tony Blair. That whole business of, of no, no statues, no history, will take photos of ministers in front of shiny new buildings. The, the past was a problem that needed to be dealt with or ignored. Is that something you'd recognise, Melanie? Do you think, do you think we're overstating the, the importance of Blair or not in this? Well, uh, clearly, uh, the left was instrumental in doing all this. Uh, the left took over um, uh, the universities uh, in the sense that um, it became the kind of default position. Um, I think that's, you know, that much is unarguable. But what's being left out of this discussion so far is the role played by the conservative movement, the small C conservative and large C conservative party, and that's because it didn't play a role. The crucial thing was that the conservative movement over the last half century, in my view, has progressively forgotten what it has to conserve. And when all this was happening, and I don't buy this idea that the Blair administration was full of communists. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Um, they didn't have to be communists to do all this. Uh, it was a generally accepted progressive worldview uh, which came out of the universities uh, going back decades. It was to do with the, the obliteration of truth, uh, the, sub, the, the substitution of subjectivity and opinion for objectivity, and I believe all that came out of what I would call the demoralization after the Second World War and the Holocaust, this idea that the Holocaust uh, hadn't happened in some benighted part of the world, it had actually happened in the very epicenter of Western civilization and European culture. And I believe that that did a terrible thing in that it basically demoralized the West, particularly Europe, uh, which came to believe that modernity itself had produced this terrible thing. Britain was demoralized because it came out of the Second World War bankrupt in hoc to America. It had famously lost an empire, was losing an empire, and not finding a role. And that's why it eventually went into the European Union. It believed that Britain was finished. Um, now, uh, along came Mrs. Thatcher in due course and said, up with this, I will not put, and Britain isn't finished, and we're going to put the mojo back into Britain. Not that she quite expressed it like that, but anyway. But the fact was that all this time, and including Mrs. Thatcher and under Mrs. Thatcher, the conservative movement, small c and, la and large c, didn't realize the cultural revolution that was underway. And that was because they didn't think in terms of culture. They only first thought in terms of economy and politics. And especially after the Soviet Union fell, and it took a long time for the Soviet Union to fall. I mean, ideologically, it was falling a long time before the Berlin Wall, but before the Berlin Wall actually fell. Um, uh, when Soviet communism fell, and I remember these discussions at the time, the conservative movement said to itself, well, what do we do now for an uncle? Uh, we've won. Uh, our fox has been shot. Um, the, the danger is over. What do we do now uh, in terms of an ideology, in terms of an idea that can galvanize us? All these decades we've been fighting uh, Soviet communism and now it's over. What do we do now? And the answer was, we hang our hat on liberty. And I remember thinking that, that was a catastrophic error because that brought them into line with the left and they were unable to see that while the left championed liberty or I would say libertarianism in the social and cultural sphere and did the kind of damage that your uh, new book talks about, uh, the right was doing the same thing in the economic sphere and they kind of met in the middle. And the conservative party in Britain, the conservative movement in the West, never understood and still does not understand the depth and profundity of the cultural revolution that was underway and which we can now see has emerged 
in all its horror. I think uh, you've, 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 you've mentioned there the horror. Uh, how do you think, I mean, well, you've alluded to it there, Molly, but how do you think the results of the Long March are being seen currently in this particular cultural crisis we're going through at the moment of the past, what, basic month, six weeks, which has gone with extraordinary speed. I mean, where do you think the Long March features in that? Is it in the actual response of our institutions, for example? Well, I mean, everyone's so amazed that all the, you know, the toppling of the statues, uh, the onslaught on the cultural history of Britain and the West. And it is a terrible thing to see. But this has been going on for at least three or four decades. I reported on this uh, in the 1980s. I was writing columns about this and then books about this. Um, the idea that education could no longer be assumed to be what it actually is, which is the transmission of a culture down through the generations, because the culture was deemed to be racist, colonialist, white and exploitative. And consequently, it couldn't be taught uh, because uh, all those terrible things. And children had to be taught instead that Britain was born in sin, in imperial sin. And that was related to the, uh, the whole sort of movement of transnationalism, which held that the, the Western nation itself was fundamentally illegitimate. And only transnational institutions and laws, the United Nations, the European Union, international human, uh, the, the, the International Court of Human Rights, and so on and so forth, European Court of Human Rights, uh, these things had legitimacy, which, which, which trumped the sovereignty and legitimacy of uh, domestic uh, legislation. Um, and so this has been the cultural default for, for, you know, for decades. And this idea that nobody could gainsay any of these ideologies. There were many other ideologies that came forward, multiculturalism, transnationalism, um, all kinds of isms. The idea that no one could gainsay them because they were all about the betterment of the world, this idea that the left has, that it stands for virtue, and so anybody who opposes it is not just wrong, but evil and must be extirpated. That's been going on for decades. I mean, you know, those of us who've been in the trenches in all this for all this time have found the platforms on which we are able to stand diminishing in number uh, almost by the day. This has been going on for years. Academics who have transgressed the cultural orthodoxy in, uh, on campus in areas such as um, environmentalism or scientism, they have been uh, fired their job prospects have been removed, they have become social pariahs. This has been going on for years. And so what we've now seen is the complete collapse of the, uh, the institutions, the, the, the people in authority who faced with literal violence and vandalism on the streets in pursuit of this whole agenda of what I would call cultural totalitarianism no other idea is to be permitted, they are giving in and giving up and running away and enabling this to happen. That is what is the shock of, to me, of the last uh, few weeks. But the idea that this is something new, that you know, suddenly we've got a cultural evolution, is ridiculous. Mm. Well, I don't know anybody who said that this is a new phenomenon at all. I mean, it definitely has been around for decades. Um, and certainly, you know, Churchill once said, we shape our buildings, thereafter our buildings shape us. And that used to be the case, but the problem is now, our institutions have cuckoos in the nest, and they have actually been absolutely no connection at all with the culture, the environment, the values, the principles that led to the institutions being, being created in the first place. And so um, I think, <laughs> if anything, if we're going to solve this now, um, we really only have a short space of time because I think the Tory party is very complacent now thinking that it has this 80 seat majority and that it's got, you know, it's got the public on side when we know full well, as Marx pointed out in his book, if the general election were held only between those age 18 to 24, there would have been over a 400 seat majority for, for the left. So really, there has to be something that's done in, in the next little while on this point. Yeah, and something I say on the book is, is that I think it's helpful if you're trying to work out you know, strategies forward or, or what to do about this to stop being complacent and to accept that, that the Long March has succeeded. 
Uh, and I think that was true before recent events, but I think recent events are confirmed. I talk about the, the sacking of Roger Scruton uh, by a sort of Twitter mob. As a conservative party that could tolerate that and indeed actively make sure that that happened is no longer in any meaningful sense a conservative party. If they wouldn't stand up for their premier philosopher, then, you know, in public, then obviously they, they are not conserving anything uh, meaningful. So the loss has happened, the long march has succeeded, the institutions, importantly as I argue in the book, are now not very good at doing their jobs because they're hopelessly politicised and they're spending all their time on pushing these agendas uh, rather than being able to police or, or do any of the things that matter, like educate people. Uh, but you have to accept that and then work out what sort of mm, insurgent strategy you want to try. But if you're complacent, just think, well, it's all right, it was just one side or another, we're still playing this all out. It's not like that at all. Before we come to you know, what, what actually what one can do about it, I want to ask Melanie particularly, obviously you, you, your book almost have prizes you know, about the education system. Um, you know, this is at the nub of it, is it, isn't it? You said earlier on that schools really should be passing on culture and that's the point of education. That's entirely gone. Um, but, you know, you, you were writing your book, uh, it was quite some time ago, but it was obvious, presumably, that by then the left had more or less overtake, taken over the cultural educational establishment in schools, I mean. Yes, uh, it was obvious by then, to me, anyway. Uh, I wrote that, I think that book was published in uh, um, 96, I think. Yeah. Um, and uh, it got howled down. Um, and I wrote about the education system in that book, uh, Almost Have Prizes, and in the context of a moral breakdown, uh, because I, I could see that it was a cultural moral breakdown as well. It was the whole idea of the culture and the, 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 the values and the principles upon which the West was based. Uh, the attack upon all that lay behind the attack on the education system. But I wrote subsequently a book which was published in 2010, called The World Turned Upside Down, The Global Battle Over God, Truth and Power, in which um, uh, I moved it all on very considerably. And I looked then at the, at, you know, what, what was causing this. It's not enough just to say, you know, the education system is rotten, which it is, or the universities are rotten, which they are. You know, one has to look at, you know, what's, what the rot consists of. Um, and um, it seemed to me, and it still seems to me, um, that uh, what's happened is that uh, the West, which is founded basically upon biblical morality, I mean, people don't like to talk about this, but it's from the Hebrew Bible mediated through Christianity that the West gets values which the secular world tells, them, tells itself, it, it invented, um, values such as uh, conscience, uh, law, compassion, uh, putting, the, putting the interests of others above yourself, which is the basis of a civilized society. Now, uh, the Long March uh, got rid of all that and replaced it by man-made ideas called ideologies. Now, the point about an ideology is that it does not admit to any kind of challenge. And what we're living through is a kind of millenarian reprise in the Middle Ages, millenarian Christians believing that the perfection of the world the end, of the end of days and the perfection of the world was on, on hand, um, uh, 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 extirpated uh, anybody who stood in their way. Um, and, you know, our modern ideologies are very much like that. They're all utopian, so they're all impossible. When they're shown to be impossible, they move on to other ideologies, which are also utopian and also impossible. As these things fail they uh, take victims, they make victims of people who they light upon as scapegoats and whom they punish. Uh, and then they turn on each other. And all these things we've seen, you know, the world saw in the Middle Ages, we are seeing played out now in a man-made ideological uh, framework. Um, and uh, so this is what we're grappling with. Um, and, you know, you talk about, you know, what, what, what to do. Shortly before he died, Roger Scruton had been brought to despair by all this. And he had come to the conclusion, and he said uh, in perfect seriousness, that because the universities, which are supposed to be the crucible, after all, of um, uh, knowledge, uh, free thinking, the free expression of ideas, without which knowledge and reason cannot survive, they have turned into vectors of uh, unreason and authoritarianism. 
uh, and total, I would say totalitarianism. Um, and they are destroying knowledge. And consequently, Roger concluded that the only way that we could begin to get ourselves out of this was to close down the universities, by which he meant keep the bits that are good, which is the, mm -hmm. basically the hard stuff, the science, which is based still broadly on objective truths, um, and get rid of the humanities, because the humanities have been almost completely captured by ideology and propaganda. And, you know, if you have young people who are going through this system, then it's not surprising that they are behaving in the way that they are behaving. Do you think, Mark, that uh, Scruton's idea, which I remember when he came on the programme, uh, do you, do you, would you agree with that? I mean, do you think the time has come to disestablish these places? Well, it's slightly hard to know how you even begin that task, but certainly in the book, as I, I point out, you know, Blair's massive expansion of, of university attendance was a complete cultural disaster and didn't succeed on any of the social goals that he was nominally trying to achieve as well. Uh, and, that, and that's been a huge problem, and that certainly needs to be reversed. But, I mean, where's the political will for something on that scale? But certainly, yeah, a, def a defunding of the humanities is, is the way to go. Unfortunately, the, the gov government funding doesn't account for all of all of the funding that the humanities receives, but uh, I've said so many times on this program uh, over the months that you've gone from a situation where you had a two-to-one balance for two liberals for every one conservative on, on, on in, the, in the academy to one now where it's eight or nine to one. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. happened really over the space of, of, uh, of, of, of 20 years. I spent eight years at university, five was in, in the humanities, three was in law, and, I, and I've seen that process take place. Um, and you know, but you're perfectly right. You know, when you have over fifty percent of, of students now going to of young people going to university, this is the exact forum where where change needs to happen if we're going to see any attempt to reverse the march through the institutions. But it's not just the universities. Where I should say also, the, the few conservatives that there are at universities are in the STEM uh, areas because they actually have to test theories with with um, with um, analysis and, yes. and, uh, and and data. But actually, it's the entire concepts of, of educating people from the age, you know, give me a boy when he's seven and I will show you the man. And if you speak again to people who understand these things, they will tell you that basically it takes 20 years to have a cultural revolution in terms of creating a system whereby you have a child going up through the entire education system taken to believe the new values that are being brought in. Because this really is, is, is a postmodernist revolution. This is something about you know, Jacques Derrida and his, and his entourage, who basically said that there are no truths. There's an infinite number of explanations and interpretations that you can have. And so any society that has no truths has to replace it with, 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 with an, a, a, nihilistic, a nihilistic world. And that's what we have now. And so there has to be some means by which you can actually take into check teacher training colleges, the primary school system, the secondary school system, where fewer than 10% of teachers actually vote Tory. There has to be some overhaul, and how that can be done, who knows? But really, it, it takes someone, I think, like Dominic Cummings and Michael Gove as really the only people I can think of right now who are in a position to influence government policy in a way where this has any chance of happening, if it's to happen at all. And it's quite, uh, it's, 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 talk about a mountain. Do you think, uh, Melanie, do you have, Melanie, do you have any sort of faith at all in, say, the what you might call the conventional political leadership. Uh, Rafe just mentioned Dominic Cummings and Michael Gove. I mean, do you, do, what, what, what's your reaction when you hear those names? I laugh. Um, I'm afraid uh, I don't think that any of them has the will to take on any of this. I mean, Boris, um, you know, from all we know of him, is a natural libertarian. Now, um, uh, uh, you know, it is said he's been changed by his illness. Uh, so he's become more of a kind of, uh, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's become a, an aficionado of the big society in a way that he wasn't previously. Well, that may or may not be true, but all this sort of, cut, the, the, the deeper cultural stuff, he's not going to want to go near. And you can see they are running away from it. Having said that, um, I mean, well, Michael Gove made a, a, you know, a big speech uh, at Ditchley uh, a few days ago. And in, you know, it was a very impressive speech. Everything Michael does is very impressive. It's, it's very intelligent and it's very thoughtful and it's backed up by a great deal of knowledge, um, a very well crafted. And he made some, you know, very useful and important points, but he avoided all of this. Yes, um, exactly. He was, he, he was making the point, you know, how did we lose Britain? How do we, how do we get, you know, the, how do we not see 
what happened in the Brexit vote. How have we lost the faith of all those people? Now, all those people aren't sitting around, you know, in the famous red wall seats. They're not sitting around saying, you know what, that Derrida has got a lot to answer for. They're not doing that. They're not saying it's all postmodern and it's beyond, you know, it's ideology. They, they, the people, by and large, don't think like that. But they are reacting against a society which has been formed by these ideas. Um, they're reacting against it because they know it's wrong. They want their country back. They want to be able to belong to a culture that they recognize, uh, that they identify with, that they know was built upon hundreds of years of history for which their ancestors fought and died for the liberties that were given. All these things they know almost instinctively. And they're reacting against... Uh, the attempt, which has been wildly successful until that Brexit vote, to put all this into reverse. Now, the political class just won't go anywhere near this. Uh, they perceive that the world has changed. They think they can't be like Canute and, you know, stand in front of the waves of progress and hold them back. They think they can't turn back the clock. They think it's to put, it's to turn back the clock. They think that in order to restore a kind of cultural order is to put back the clock. And unfortunately, they are therefore hell-bent on continuing down this uh, path, as has been said, of nihilism, um, which they don't recognize that they don't even think, they don't, they don't allow themselves to think in these terms. Uh, because they say, well, what can we do? It's all too big, you know, it's, it's the church. The church is, you know, responsible. Well, to a large extent, that is true. But I do very much believe that culture very much is a top-down thing and that um, cultural leadership is absolutely crucial. And if you had a prime minister and very senior minister, but if you have a, a prime minister who articulated what I've just been saying and kept on and on about it, and also said, you know, up with this, we will not put. We are no longer going to fund these ridiculous courses. They are ridiculous for these reasons. They are telling lies. These are the lies they are telling. This is propaganda. It's not true what they say. Then you would find that they, you know, I, I believe the whole atmosphere would change almost overnight. Not that yeah. it would win the war, but it would be a start. And without that, we can't proceed properly. Yes, but and I mean, I, I agree entirely. I think we're all on the same page with regards to that. But I think that the Tory party is aware, or at least there are figures there. And I will again say, I think single out Cummings particularly on this point, because this is the man who, who understands that there's been a, the inversion that's taken place in the support base for the Labour Party and for the Tory party. And it's now the low income people in the North, etc., who, who want cultural security who are on side with, with, with the Conservative Party. And of course, we've, we've always known Boris Johnson was, 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 a, was a token uh, right-winger on cultural values and those sorts of issues. But yet it has to be the case, surely, that they know that there's an existential crisis facing the Tory party if they don't use the next 10 years wisely for the very reason that I pointed out earlier. <laughs> the, the, those under 30 are not voting Tory. And the Tory party will be facing oblivion if it doesn't take into account this fact and try, and try its best to change that. And the way that it, and having hemorrhaged so much support now over its handling of COVID and coronavirus, it actually is, I think, cultural issues, a strong stance on, on these things, which will give it a chance to actually reconnect with that red wall base and shore up its support for the, for the future. Well, I'm sure that's true, though, but, but who's going to stand up and do it? And I, I think Mel, Melanie's no, right on you. this. You know, I mean, culture, you know, can come from politics as well. And in fact, in some ways, Margaret Thatcher understood that as well, although she didn't always um, fight it so much on the, on the cultural front, but she, she, she could be very strong. And um, Boris does have an opportunity, but he he's, not he ain't, taking it, he's not he? taking he's it not in taking the way that, say, Macron did in, in France a little bit. Mm. I think it's interesting, actually, uh, you know, you, when you talk about the, the cultural onslaught that we've had over the past 40, 50, 50 60 years now, <clears throat> um, quite often people, they sense it, they, they know it, they feel got out, they feel undermined, um, but it's often very... Uh, incoherent. They don't quite know how to protest. But, but then along comes an issue, uh, what might seem like a, a small one, which at the moment is the, the toppling of statues, for example. That seems to crystallise it for them. I think it seems to, it crystallises it for them. Actually, I think, wait a minute, this is wrong. I feel personally affronted. Right, this.
That's right. I'm, and it was very, you know, it, you, you can't get more a more physical, uh, material manifestation of the destruction of a culture than the toppling of every statue uh, that matters. Uh, and, you know, you can see it goes from, you know, people who, OK, they had, you know, view, you know, they, 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 they were slavers. Uh, uh, and then it progresses uh, to the point where they are taking down statues of people who were anti-slavers and reformers. Um, so, uh, yes, um, I think that um, it's, uh, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a very uh, vivid illustration. When we, we talk about, you know, we have already touched on what, what, what one could possibly do. Are we sort of agreed that basically maybe we should get rid of humanities departments? I mean, is that, what would you say, Mark? Well, you know, I mean, the humanities in its true form is, is at the heart of a true education and Western culture. And, you know, I have, a, I have a book on liberal education in the, in the, in the mm. Greek sense, you know, which, which um, is enormously important. The tragedy of all of this is, you know, the left going into institutions that really matter, like the police, like the schools, like the universities and the humanities departments, gutting them putting on the sort of the skin suit of them and then saying, look at me, you need to bow down and worship this thing that used to be a good institution. And that's the horror of it. And, and, and one good thing about Michael Gove's speech, which I agree, of course, was dancing around the issues, was that he was trying to use competence as a way of dealing with, you know, the, the takeover of these institutions. If they became practically wise again, able to get things done and see whether what they did actually worked and what the consequences were. That is actually one way of cracking down on politicization, uh, but, but not enough. But isn't it, sorry, isn't it the point of, you know, I, would, I would agree with what something Melanie said there, is that you do feel that if just people did talk, you know, as a good leader should talk, just talk about these things and say I'm outraged and we will not put up with this or whatever it is, uh, this is a great country, all of these, that somehow people would feel reassured and less well, as they are now, I think, rather frightened and angry. Do you, do you see any chance, Rafe, right, that, that people will actually start to, you know, well, change our political culture and actually start talking about these things? Well, conversations are being had, but unfortunately not in the mainstream media. You have to come onto platforms like this, and you can't have those conversations on all of social media because you'll be suspended and banned, as we've seen yesterday with Graham Linehan, you know, banned from Twitter for having said, you know, men aren't women, though. Um, I mean, that is the extent to which we've, 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 we're, we're living in this Kierkegaardian post-revolutionary world of ours. Um, the problem with getting rid of institutions like the humanities, of course, is that there'll be nowhere left to teach history. I mean, we have to actually provide people with a, with, with a standard of education where actually they recognise and appreciate Western civilization and culture for what it is. Because basically what we're seeing is an onslaught against Western civilization, against, against, uh, against the individual and, and the logos. I mean, this is, Melanie is quite right, this is a, akin to a millenarian movement here with the flagellants now being yeah. world virtue signalling. Mm. There's, there's a direct connection there. So I, in my view, one of the solutions to this, and I've said this for a while, would be to actually try to set up private educational institutions such as you know AC Grayling was able to do it on his side but you know as you see in America there are very effective colleges uh, present and if we can somehow create universities that teach the classics that teach history and the great and the greatness of western civilization and cultural values without this blatant bias that would be one solution because I can't see that simply getting rid of the humanities is a solution when you're going to have a population who have no context at all in which to put the, the buildings and the statues of, around which they walk every day. Although I would say possibly that one of the reasons we've got this problem at the moment is because they have absolutely no context yeah, anyway. Exactly, they, yeah, they've absolutely. not been taught it. Um, Mark, you mentioned in the book uh, about being a dissident. Uh, mm. I don't know. First of all, do you feel like a dissident and, and how should a dissident live in that case? <laughs> well, I, I talk about in the book how being a dissident is, is a very unpleasant life. Uh, one shouldn't think, um, I talk about the examples in, in, in communism in Eastern Europe and so on, you shouldn't think being a dissident is going to necessarily change a regime. You shouldn't expect it to accept that you have a different view and not treat you very badly. The story of dissidents is, is, is of people who did something that they felt that their conscience didn't allow them not to do. Uh, but there are high costs that come with that. And most people don't want to do it. And even if you do do it, the fact that you then get shouted down and banned and, and lose your job is very effective at silencing other people. So it doesn't necessarily help. It may even help the, the regime in crushing uh, public opinion. So unfortunately, the choice for most people, as you see, is, is silence. 
uh, and some form of, of sort of collaboration with what goes on, but even though people know in their own consciences that, this, that there's nonsense being talked, um, they don't feel that they can say it, they don't feel safe saying it, which makes the problem worse and worse, and that's why you know, things like bankrupt co communist regimes could go on for, for many decades when you know, they should by all rights have fallen. Uh, and it's very hard to find ways, ways through this. It's partly about simply creating the possibility of public speech, public acknowledgement of the reality. And, and then that can cascade and then people can feel that, that they too can, can speak up. That, that can change a culture very fast. And we've seen that to a degree with Gavin Williamson stating that universities have their last chance now to protect free speech. You know, whether that's going to be enforced is, is another question altogether. But it actually is, actually, and one way in which you can start this rolling is to have a commitment to free speech to actually have an assertive policy on, part, on behalf of the government whereby you actually ensure that there is academic freedom and you don't have cases of people being, being, losing their position or not being hired in the first place for holding contrary views to the mainstream. Uh, and also an acknowledgement that it, you have now a vocal minority who are basically uh, in positions of power where we have a situation where you have the Eloy and the Morlock really, where you have this elite ruling who aren't reflective of, 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 the, of the population and so I think really the, there'll be a time for us to actually try to inf infuse the grassroots with some sort of, um, with some of the fire that we want to see amongst our younger population. Uh, Melanie, do, do, you know, do you, do you feel like a dissident actually? I mean in our culture, do you feel like a dissident? Don't use the word, oh, I, I wouldn't use the word about myself, dissident, because I associate that with the heroes who fought behind uh, the, ty the tyrannies uh, of the Soviet Union. Um, and, you know, I, th I think one should be quite careful about uh, not suggesting that we are in that kind of situation. We are still a free society. We're still a democracy. Uh, we still have a raucous uh, public sphere. Um, uh, the fact is that they, they, though that within that raucous public sphere, there have been significant encroachments uh, in the last uh, several decades, I would say, um, on people's ability to say things which contrary, which are contrary to the orthodoxies. Now, have I felt that personally? Absolutely, I have felt that personally. Um, uh, I, uh, I wrote a little memoir called Guardian Angel, uh, which was published in paperback a couple of years ago. Uh, which detail precisely what happened to me when I started saying all this, when I was still considered to be part of the left when I was working for The Guardian back in the 1980s. And uh, subsequently, um, uh, you know, you can look at uh, the books that I've had published, um, with the exception of Londonistan, which was a book about Britain, um, and which was not, until about one month before it was published in America, was not going to be published in Britain. Um, it was published in Britain by the skin of its teeth. Uh, a small publishing house, literally publishing out of someone's front room, came and published it. Other than that, over the last 20 years or so, my books have been published in America. Um, uh, so, you know, um, and, and I'm fortunate. I have a, you know, I'm, I'm still employed. Uh, uh, in uh, national newspapers. Um, but my goodness me, it becomes ever more difficult to hang on uh, when, uh, the, you know, when the, the entire uh, cultural uh, intelligentsia world is trying to stop uh, people who contradict these orthodoxies from having any platform at all. I mean, for example, um, not just in Britain, but also in America, I do quite a lot of public speaking in America, but it's been a great source of uh, frustration to me over the last 10, 20 years that the people that I speak to in America are people who broadly are on my side, broadly, yeah. uh, because the people who are on the other side, the left, um, uh, will not have the discussion. You see, you can't, you can't even open up the discussion. They won't have the discussion. They replaced discussion and debate by insult, character assassination, and other terrible maneuvers to silence you. Now, in my view, uh, people who do that do that for one reason only. Uh, they are too frightened to have the debate because they know their position is built on sand, uh, which makes it even more frustrating that one can't actually have the discussion. So to that extent, I mean, I have felt very, you know, very, uh, very much uh, at the sharp end of all this, 
And But there's a whole number of us who have felt like this for some time. And as I say, I wouldn't like to exaggerate it because, you know, especially now there is the internet, there are now many more avenues uh, open to all of us. Uh, we can all self-publish, uh, you know, uh, we can, I can, you know, put a camera in front of myself and go online. Um, that's all available to us. Nevertheless, um, uh, given what's out there, um, and given the um, still the, uh, the 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 kudos, the the, the credibility, uh, the public credibility that comes from being published or hosted on mainstream media platforms, um, these are still, I think, uh, small pickings. I know there are some people who have, you know, made stellar reputations out of being dissidents on the net, um, but they are very. I think they are few and far between. Uh, most of us uh, don't have that um, uh, good fortune. I think uh, the internet is incredibly important. Uh, as for those platforms you talk about there and how it's becoming more difficult for people who go against the orthodoxies, uh, possibly those platforms themselves are now losing reputation and losing traction. I mean, I'm thinking of the mainstream, the BBC and whatever, but... Look, um, we, we'd have to end it there. Um, the book, again, is called The Long March, How the Left Won the Culture War and What to Do About It by Mark Sidwell. Um, Melanie, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Mark, as well, again. Thank you, Rafe. And uh, we shall see you next time. Of course, when it comes to the book, um, please do go on our website and contact us, and we can happily send you uh, a copy. But also, it is downloadable for free. Um, so however you want to read it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.